Hi, marketers. This is Dot, and welcome to the Marketing Leadership Podcast. With me here is Katia Allison, Head of Marketing at Shared Vision, and also the host of Let's Talk Marketing Podcast. We will discuss the dimensions of profitable influencer marketing strategies. I know you guys are ready, so let's get it. Katia, it's good to finally have you here. I love your energy. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. I'm excited to be on here to chit chat about marketing, which is one of my favorite topics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, like they say, we are the magicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to tell me uh, or tell us uh, listening uh, a bit about yourself, uh, your background, your role, and um, how you have uh, tend to become what I call the queen of influencer marketing. Oh man, I love it. Um, had I known, I would have come with my crown ready. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think a little bit about me, probably the best way that I can articulate it is, you know, my role in marketing has not been a straight line. It's been a lot of mm. just kind of twists and turns to get here. If I have to break it down to like, when was like, when did I get like this marketing bug? Honestly, mm -hmm. it was in high school. I'm not going to tell you the year because that's going to age me. Um, you can just <laughs> my white hair to, and, and do some math. Um, but I would say like back in high school, I was part of a travel and tourism academy and we had our, a marketing class and breaking down the mm -hmm. psychology of good print advertisement was a huge part of it. And that's where I just kind mm -hmm. of got the bug. And honestly, everything that happened in my career after that was really, you know, I... I'd step in with like a, a role in accounting or a business development, and then eventually mm -hmm. gets into sales and communications and marketing. Like it was something that just continued to pull me back in. And, you know, one of the biggest gifts that I've ever received is someone telling me to play in the gray space. And I've been doing that ever since. And that's led me to, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, over a decade, um, <laughs> you know, 14, 15 years later. And, you know, I'm head of marketing at an amazing startup, you know, hosting a podcast. And it really is playing in the gray space and saying yes to things that you didn't fully see how they were going to pan yeah. out and just putting your best foot forward. Yeah, absolutely. I love uh, what I would call a summary bio there. I, I think uh, just to latch on that point a bit before I move ahead, uh, saying yes to things, showing up. Um, I know it's very cliche. But it's true. You just have to, you know, show up, be proactive, uh, just start however it is and, um, you know, see where that takes you. Uh, but something yeah. else you've also gotten um, is all these great business relationships across the world. Um, I remember, you know, back in my corporate marketing days, um, I think that was in 2018, 2019, um, mm -hmm. where you get to do influencer marketing and then there is a celebrity that comes up and I get home, I speak to my wife, I'm like, hey, I just met this guy, <laughs> you know? So uh, or I just yeah. met this important person and things like that. It's always very nice. Um, right, right now you've done that for decades and it's almost like second nature to you. So what are some of the lessons you've learned in building business relationships in general, not necessarily marketing relationships or well, you know big yeah. relationships in the business world i think you know relationships in general feeds into everything in that you do in your personal and in your professional life and it definitely feeds mm. into your professional life and the the best way to summarize it for me is be of service be of service. Okay. And I'm, you know, anybody that reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I say that as well too. Great connecting. How can I be of service? And even the things that seem very spammy, you just never know what relationships are going to pan out to and don't go into these these connections, these relationships, these networking opportunities with like, all right, yeah. what can you do for me? That's not the way that you would start any relationship. So it always starts with being of service. What can I do to help? Is it a connection? Is it just a conversation? You know, um, or yeah, do you do you want advice? Like, it's amazing. Or can I pick your brain? It's really mm -hmm. being of service to the people that come to you, but also seeking 
service in others as well too. Seeking service from like a, you know, I have a question. Let me, can I pick your brain a little bit? I'll, I'll take five to 10 minutes and it goes really a long way. And then you can really nurture it because they think when you fast forward and you're like at another networking event and someone brings up a topic that this other person that you were talking to, you know, brought up, that's a way that you can connect to them. Maybe they can be of service to one another. So to me, it's really be of service um, and be open to, yeah, and be open. Yeah, I love it. Be of service, be open. I will spin that second point to authenticity as well. You know, let people yes. see the progress you are trying to make. And that has, I think that has been one of my successes with uh, this podcast, for example, uh, yeah. being very authentic, being very real. And just like you said, um, being the one to serve first, no matter how, I guess. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's not very rewarding. You know, it's like, oh, sometimes you may get to do stuff for free or whatever it is. You know, um, I'm not really a big fan of everything has to be like money, 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 money. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it would be nice. I'm not going to turn down money. So yeah, I just want to put that out there. But I do think like when it comes to establishing the relationship, you do have to be of service. Don't think of like what they can do for you first. And one yeah. thing that I did want to drill down on in regards to authenticity, I, I think that you do have to be yourself. Sometimes I feel yeah. almost like I'm a bit of a negative Nelly because I'm like, yeah, that sucks. It sucks. This was hard. Like I can yeah. show you, you know, and I think that I told you this beforehand that, you know, I spoke at VidCon recently and, mm. you know, I was asked a question about, I was asked a question and I was very honest. I'm like, yeah, that sucks. It feels horrible for my ego. And you mm -hmm. need to hear that. We're not, I think, especially in marketing, it's all about, and this is going to sound very controversial in the way that I'm going to tee this up, but in marketing, you are a bit of a spin doctor you are trying to show yeah. everyone the best foot forward for you know brands or the companies that you're working for so there's this level already of like oh you're in marketing you're just gonna you're just gonna spin it but like no it was yeah. really hard you know the accolade of getting to be you know head of marketing and you know getting a seat at the table that was really hard work it was not easy i did not take one class mm -hmm. and then it equals this i mean mm -hmm. That would be great. And had I known if there would be something like that, that would be fantastic. But I also think being able to navigate and make the connections that you can make along the way is is what gets you to to that point. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, like I say, it's not magic, it's marketing. So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. To the topic now, um, it's actually about B2B influencer campaigns or B2B yeah. influencer marketing strategies. And I looked at B2B because when it comes to influencer marketing, this is my opinion, by the way, B2B doesn't get as much love as B2C uh, for some reason. But I am wondering from your experience, how do you think the B2B um, influencer marketing works? And what are some of the kind of influencers that you can call B2B influencers? So I love this topic because I do think that there are things that we need to like, let's like, let's lay the groundwork B2B and B2C mm -hmm. and even D2C. These are not the same things. Your audience is going to yeah. be very different with B2C <laughs> and D2C. You're thinking of the end user, right? Like the consumer yeah. I'm, I, you yeah. know, I'm reaching out to that's my person. I want to market to yeah. you and you as an yeah. individual have different values and all, you know, you have different values, different wants, different needs. You're on social media. Maybe you're not, Maybe you're a blog reader. Maybe you're a review reader, right? Like as a marketer, yeah. I'm like, you are you are my buyer persona. I can see that. The difference mm -hmm. is with B2B, you are marketing to an entire buying committee, right? Mm -hmm. Sales cycles are much longer with B2B. So the approach yeah. with influencer marketing or even leveraging any sort of creator is yeah. going yeah. to be different because now you're you're marketing to a group. And in that group, let's say for, you know, this example, you've got a CEO, you've got, you know, the finance guy, you have the actual end user of whatever it is that you're it, in this instance, let's pretend it's software, right? You've got mm -hmm. the end user, but then you also have, you know, the gate 
gatekeeper, the marketing ops person that's going to say like, oh, we should get the software because it integrates with this and this, right? All of them have different viewpoints, different challenges, different pain points. And they're approaching the yes, the conversion that ultimately all marketers are held to in a very yeah. different way. So it's challenging because you have multiple buyers, you have multiple buyer personas in one deal that goes out. In one conversion, you've got to have a lot of people that say yes, typically. So I think there's a built-in challenge when it comes to that. So I think oftentimes people are taking these B2C and D2C influencer marketing tactics and trying mm. to apply them to B2B. And that's just not going to work because mm. they're very different people. I also want to take the time to say influencer marketing is leveraging someone who has a community. They've, they are the ones that have the, the street credit. Okay. They're the ones yeah. that have the yep. street credit. And because of that, street credit, the people who are following them are more likely to take the action that that influencer d has, right? Mm -hmm. um, or is asking them to, to take. And that could be on social media. It could be someone that's on a blog. It could be a, a podcast host that's not on mm -hmm. social media, right? And I think mm -hmm. when we are very myopic in our definition of what influencer marketing is, it makes it really hard to translate it. And then what ends up happening is just a frustrated CEO at a B2B spot that's like, but I thought influencer marketing would totally work. Well, first of all, it takes time. Second of all, who yeah. are you getting for that? What works for you know B2C is not going to work for B2B. You, you can activate 100 influencers and creators for B2C and see a lot, lot of success. That's not going to be the same for B2B, but you need That's to right. find our key opinion leaders, right? And you have to fish where the fish are. Like, and what I mean by that is for everybody in that buyer, that buying group, they're reading, they're engaging with a the newsletter. They're on, maybe they are on social media, but they're only on Twitter, for example, right? Like you have yeah. to really identify where all of your personas are and fish where they are at. So find influencers and creators that work or are, are in those fishing ponds. Sorry, I feel like I threw 12,000 analogies in there. Yeah, fishing pond, and then you add I know, Craig. I know. Yeah, But, but it's, it's, it's okay. I, I like the biggest point you mentioned there in terms of not mixing B2C to B2B. Uh, because, yeah. you know, for those who even want to experiment on the B2B side, they still make this mistake. You know, they try to just, you know, let's just flip yeah. it, right? See how it goes. And um, just to add to what you said in terms of who those influencers are, they could be executives uh, of, of companies, entre entrepreneurs, uh, keynote speakers, thought leaders, bloggers, and podcasters. Um, so please, uh, Katia has got a podcast at the end of this episode. She's going to um, <laughs> tell us more about that and how you guys can subscribe. There is also my podcast, uh, the Marketing Leadership Podcast. Um, so just a shameless plug for both of us out there. I love um, it. Let's I, do I'm more sure you... <laughs> We will do little breadcrumbs <laughs> and then leave us a review. Leave us a review yeah, because please. ratings and reviews matter. People look at those. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, another thing I'm, I noticed with time in terms of b2b influencer campaigns is uh the relation to uh pr or public relations um you know traditionally public relations campaigns usually come from the companies themselves by some representative but um nowadays there is always a mix of uh well not nowadays maybe for some time there's there is a mix of uh you know whether it's representative from the companies or um, influencers themselves, and I'm speaking about B2B now, uh, getting involved with some of those things. What has been your experience, especially on the B2B side, having, you know, whether it's celebrities or, or influencers taking part in, in B2B influencer campaigns that's, that's got like a PR spin to it? What are some of the issues you've seen? Feel free to tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly sides. So... I would say, I always feel like with marketing, the good, the bad, the ugly is a, a more a lack of education on what we mean by all of these terms. I think in marketing, we mm -hmm. tend to lean into a lot of jargon that's very yeah. unnecessary. Uh, and, you know, the use of 
PR with influencer marketing and, you know, for the B2B world, I think a great execution is understanding the relationship between all of those, right? Okay. So get ready for an analogy and I'm hungry, so I will lean on food as an analogy, but I like to I think of, you know, right? Like I, I, as, I, as the business am the person that's in charge of making the meal, right? And one of the main dishes is going to be influencer marketing, right? Influencer marketing mm -hmm. is this dish that I'm preparing and PR is all of the seasoning. It is amplifying the taste mm. of what it, that dish that I'm cooking, right? So understanding that relationship, I think leads to very successful campaigns with influence marketing and PR. I think mm. people miss it if they don't leverage it in that way. I also think that it is not about how big the name is. So mm. I, I will lean on Kim Kardashian for this one or any of the Kardashians. They're huge That's names. Right. They are, am yeah. they're amazing yeah. businesswomen. People know them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that I want a Kardashian representing maybe my software brand, right? That yeah. doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's not my audience. That's not what they're interested in. So it, it's also the, a common mistake that I see is like thinking, they've got the big name, they've got that big follower account, like that's what's going to get me like all of those conversions, the sales, the business. And that's really just mm -hmm. not what it is. Like you have to find influencers and, and creators that match what your audience is looking for. And when it comes to B2B, that's multiple creators. So it's yeah. more about getting like the right ones can be incredibly effective. So you may not need as large of a pool as you would in like B2C. So hopefully mm -hmm. that answers the question. I feel like I veered off a little bit, but... You, you, you did not, because I was actually going to ask you um, some things about micro-influencers, and uh, yeah. you, you, just nailed, you just nailed that, uh, because I, I think a lot of brands still mess this up. You know, they just pick yeah. someone, say, in the sporting sector, promoting something about tech or something like that. I mean, it's gotten better over time, but there is still a lot of misfits going on. Uh, I guess people count on the 30% or 50% chance that their audiences are part of those, um, whether it's celebrity or influencer communities. Uh, yeah. And then people maybe try to do some parallel um, audience interest. So if I'm interested yeah. in stocks, then I must be interested in tennis. So I can get a stock edge fund celebrity to to talk about tennis, you know, stuff like that. You know, again, I'm not here to um, downgrade any work that anyone is doing out there, but the more specific it is, the better. You know, um, influencer Absolutely. marketing is a... Yeah, please go ahead. You wanted to add a few things there. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I'm such an interrupter. I was just going to say it's not a popularity no, like... contest. Like, it, it, yeah. it isn't. And I think, like, that's the biggest mistake that you can make. It's a popularity contest. The right influencer and creator for a B2B brand can be someone that is not known to the whole world. Like, that's okay, you know? And maybe that is a micro-influencer, but maybe it's not. It Maybe it's a macro-influencer in the business world, right? Maybe like, yeah, we yeah, all yeah. know who Gary Vee is. Like he's yeah, a key do. opinion leader in my eyes. Is he an influencer also? Yeah. Absolutely. But he's a key opinion yeah. leader from like a business perspective. I think yeah. the other day I, um, I just finished reading this book called uh, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. And to mm. me, Simon Sinek is all over my feed. So if I see him, I like absolutely know him. I was talking about this book to somebody else. I don't even remember who it was. Uh, because I'm such a chatty Cathy. I talk to a lot of people, but um, I was telling them about this book and I was like, oh, is Simon Sinek is the one that wrote it. And they completely blank. Like he is mm -hmm. a, a, a key opinion leader for me from a leadership perspective, because that's what's important yeah. to me. And yeah. I mean, that's an example of someone who has like celebrity status in this key opinion uh, leader role, but it's, he's not someone that everybody knows. He's someone that a lot of people know and the people who know him, it's because they find value in his content. And that's why I think it's really tricky. And it takes a lot of time to find the right person for your brand. There is no, I mean, there's a lot of platforms out there. I obviously used to work for a 
creator management platform. There are a lot of platforms out there, but there is no easy way to do it. I mean, there's an easy way to aggregate probably mm -hmm. some some people based on demographics and, you know, up from graphics and all of those types of things. But to find mm -hmm. the right one for your brand, it takes some digging. Like what kind of content are they pushing out on social, mm -hmm. on website, on their podcast? What, what's their opinion about it? How do they deliver information and their thoughts? Does that align with what I see? Because ultimately, when you activate a creator, a key opinion leader, an influencer as a brand, mm -hmm. like you're asking them to use their voice, not telling them what to say. They're not mouthpieces. They're not puppets. Like the And mm -hmm. you, you, you really have to wrap your head around that. And I think it's it's tough because it is something that takes time and you don't always see those bottom of funnel like conversions that yeah. you know executives yeah. want to see because that that keeps you know that keeps the the hamster wheel turning yeah absolutely and you know just to make a quick point on uh managing expectations yeah i think um regular communications with stakeholders on any campaign whatsoever uh, yes. most especially the performance marketing ones always communicating frequently tricks them into <laughs> falling for progress versus targets so yeah. you know sometimes what happens is that marketers don't communicate and i understand why they are afraid what are they going to say but the more you communicate the more frequently you communicate the more you shift the mindset of leadership into thinking okay there is progress even though the target has not been met so at least I, I, that's something that i think would be a good advice that has worked for me personally um when yeah. it comes to managing expectations and not stifling creativity running campaigns the way campaigns should be run. Um, I also like what you said, Katia, about, so influencer marketing is the, I call them vertical, the, the marketing vertical. But PR is the channel to push it, to push that vertical forward. One of one of the channels to push that vertical yeah. forward. You know, so it's not really like the other way around or, yeah, they do work together in a way, but I see this more as um, it's a PR being like a subset of influencer marketing. Then you can have some other uh, channels within this influencer marketing vertical that pushes the campaign forward. Does that structure make sense to you or I'm just making things up? Um, <laughs> well, you're just making things up. No, I'm just kidding. We all make things up <laughs> as marketers. I think that's really the key of it. Um, I would say this is actually a really great example of something I see happen continuously in marketing is that we all have our own terms for everything. So as you're saying that, yeah. I'm like, oh, I totally view it differently. But it is also yeah. the same to me. I put yeah. them almost in. <laughs> see, now, now I'm going to use my own language, but it's basically saying no, the same okay. thing. Because I'm saying like, mm. I have buckets, I have buckets. And uh, to me, the bucket is content. And then all of the okay. other strategies are how I amplify that content. But you look at them as verticals and then different channels to distribute that. It's all the same. Like I've got this, yeah. how am I going to get it out there? And we have all of these okay. different distribution channels, right? If for creators and influencer marketing, I think everyone I was always thinking, oh, that's social media. But it's not only yeah. social media. You can use that for email. You can use that for your website. You can use that for yeah. your blog, right? You can use it for your PR. You can leverage. It's all about the content that you have and how you're going to distribute that. And the content also feeds into like, what's the message in that content, right? What am I providing? Mm. And they're all, you know, it's all about answering the questions that people have. So I, yeah. I think we all use different language because I've also seen this across my career where yeah. it, it doesn't matter. Every company I've been in, every company I've been in, every, you know, executive leadership, they all use a very different language and their words are not the same as my words. So when I talk about conversions, this is what I mean. I think the biggest unsolicited advice that I can give to any marketer is make sure that you've got your semantics down. It may seem like yeah. a really minor thing, but I've also been in circular I was going to say arguments, but that sounds so negative, but for lack of a better term, like I've been in circular yeah. arguments uh, and we're talking about the same thing, but using different words. So I think yeah. understand like level setting, what are we talking about when we talk about conversions, influencer marketing, what are your expectations on conversions? Because to me, a conversion is also getting an email. So if an influencer is going to help me do that, I'm seeing that as a return on investment because I didn't have that before. 
But for the executive, they're like, well, you didn't make the sale. So there's no return on investment in this investment uh, for influencers. Interesting. Yeah, I am a trained um, unit economics marketer. So that's yeah. why I sort of use verticals and channels. And I love like it. That. I know, but I love it. It was such a great example, though, because I'm like, I, you are not making it up, but we use different, we use different terms. And I think as marketers, like we kind of tend to, we, I think we have this agreed upon language, but I haven't, I've yet to like fully have like an agreed upon language because there's an agreed upon language as marketers. And then there's like, other people using terms and the way people throw around terms that aren't in marketing. I'm like, that's not actually what you're asking for. What you're asking for is X, Y, Z. And yes, I can do that. Like, let me, you have to be such a solid communicator to be an effective marketer in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I know. I, I understand that. And I will throw you another term here and that's affiliate marketing. Um, oh, I love, you know, I that's, love this topic. It's, it's it's just all over the place nowadays there are some spammy versions of affiliate marketing you know there are some people who are i don't know 18 or 21 who have who claim to have made 20 million dollars in a year through affiliate marketing like a lot is going on right now and i would like you to help us set the record straight when it comes to b2b affiliate marketing um what are the most creative ways to drive such campaigns without, you know, being too casual or being too spammy or, or, you know, uh, is it even still effective uh, in 2023? So I think for B2B, well, I think affiliate is effective for any business. It's how you're looking okay. at it and setting your expectations for both from a, you know, B2C perspective. Influencers are really great for affiliates because they're mm -hmm. reaching the masses and they can curate a lot of the stuff that we want to purchase. Right. But, you know, yeah. because like when I look at B2C, it's I'm thinking of a lifestyle brand. Right. And that living room has so many things that can be linked and that's how affiliates work for like B2C. Now with B2B, I almost look at it from a referral perspective and I view affiliate as like my referral program. Again, these, mm -hmm. you know, semantics, right? Mm -hmm. I, you can call it an affiliate program. The affiliate program is that you get X amount when this sale comes through the door. And typically what happens with B2B is they'll, they'll get the commission once, you know, the, the end, the, I was going to say the end user, but the brand has paid, right? Like yeah. the brand or the company or the client has paid is when that gets paid out. I think with a affiliate for B2B, again, we have to remember the challenge of B2B is that it's a longer sales cycle. So when you're evaluating your affiliate program, if it is a longer sales cycle, be realistic with how many how many conversions and sales this affiliate program that you're setting up is going to bring you. Also take a look at the commission. It's got to be very lucrative for people and it's got to be very easy. Yeah. So you're looking for the evangelists of your product to speak on your behalf because they're very authentic with their thoughts on it. They can show you how it works really quickly and you're amplifying and yeah, you're amplifying your message as the business across the people who genuinely love your brand and then they get a commission back from it. So I think it's a longer sales cycle. The commission is typically a little bit higher on something like that. Um, and again, it, that B2B also depends on like what it is that you're selling to the other business as well too. And this is also where you get into like the reseller models as well too. Okay. Like, all right, how can I, how can I make a buck? So uh, uh, there is still affiliate associated with B2B. It's just structured a little differently. And sometimes like, you know, we're using terms like referral or reseller um, to just kind of like create that affiliate environment, but nuts and bolts of it, like affiliate, mm. affiliate marketing is pay to play. It's great for yeah. B2C, B2B, because you really only pay if you get the sale. That's the ideal that is the ideal workflow for, I feel like most businesses is like, well, I'll pay you as long as I'm getting something in return. It's also a sweet spot for marketing because it's one-to-one -one attribution. Like that's what we want. We're all chasing mm. attribution fiercely. So. Yeah. 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 And I, I guess I would add that um, the cost, the acquisition costs, CAC are much higher 
uh, with affiliate marketing mm-hmm. compared to like typical um, uh, influencer. I mean, it, it, they are different. Uh, you know, it, it depends on who you're it's speaking to. Yeah. It could be higher, it could be lower. Uh, but def- but definitely you are you are you are paying that commission um, as a reward for that person's efforts and exposure rather than just giving the person a lump sum cash with no idea of whether that that is going to influence anything uh, or not. But personally, I don't think there's like a, you know, hard and fast prescriptive rule on what what you need to do. (laughs) Um, But I just wanted to remind that. Exactly. And I just wanted to remind our listeners that, uh, you know, calculating those customer acquisition costs uh, definitely makes sense. Um, one thing, I, and I've never, I've never, I've not, I've not said it before since we've been speaking. One thing that I really admire about your career is how you've seen influencer marketing from a point of verticals. Um, or sorry, not well, industry verticals. Now, not channel marketing verticals, but industry sectors. And um, except, aside from SaaS companies, which other industries do you think? Uh, B2B influencer marketing is most commonly used. I'm saying that because, yeah, it could be used anywhere and everywhere, but I have a feeling that there are more popular sectors than the other. And if anyone is listening here right now, might be saying, oh, okay, uh, so we need to get on this. So w- w- what do you think in terms of the, the most popular um, industries where B2B influencer marketing is common today? Um, I well, this may be controversial, but I don't think that it's common. I think that the B2B okay. influencer marketing space is still something that people don't know really how to best execute it because they're taking, okay. and this is t- fully my opinion, but I mm-hmm. believe that they are taking this the, the formula of influencer marketing from D to C and B to C and trying to apply it to B to B. And it is fundamentally different for all of the reasons that I had also have, I've mentioned all of the, the different yeah. challenges, the, the buyer persona. So I think, yeah. you know, from a B to B perspective, I don't, I don't know that there's an industry sector that I would say like it is more mm-hmm. most popular for or yeah. that has seen a ton of success because I, honestly, to your point, I believe it's really more about how you're going to execute it, not about your okay. sector and the quantity of key opinion leaders, influencers, creators that you use is really, I think, probably the biggest difference. I think with B2B, you typically don't need as many. You just don't mm. need as many. Um yeah, you don't need as many creators and influencers from a B2B perspective. You just need the right ones. And that's a little bit of a heavier lift. And some people aren't willing to take the time and put the budget behind trying to find the right person that honestly, if you get the right person, they could be gold for your business. They could be gold yeah. for your business. And we see this like, I feel like time and time again, like when you get the right, it's the right fit that works. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I, I I get what you mean there. Um, when it comes to again, we are still looking at you know industries, brands. Is there a school of thought where prospects, these are not customers yet, they are just prospects, but having to use them as future brand influencers. Um, that seems like a little bit on over creative, but you know, I'll give you a good example. Account-based podcasting is a means to do that. You know, you get a prospect, not a customer. You get them to talk about the industry. You slot in your brand in there and so on and so forth. So do you think uh, there is a future for um, prospect influencers? Uh, what do you think about that? Is, that? is this just me being too Nostradamus or something? I think that there is... Listen, I think that in influence marketing, we have to evolve and we're going to continue to find unique ways to be able to leverage this. So, I mean, short answer, yes. I think that there yeah. is an evolution and a time and a space for prospects to also become influencers. And I think where we, I think the most relatable example would be the mm. unboxing experience. It's the product gifting uh. that we see, right? Like it is, that's not someone that's, that's, I, to me, that's a prospect. If they haven't yeah. 
yes, they've made the purchase, but really where the money is at is when a, a customer becomes loyal. And that that mm -hmm. works for B2B and B2C, right? Like if you're going to, it's not just about making that sale. You got to keep them coming back to you. You need to make mm -hmm. them brand loyal to you. And I think that that's a problem, not a problem, a challenge. I'm trying to be very positive thinking, but Please. I think that's a challenge <laughs> across B2B, B2C is not just getting it, but keeping it. And then it becomes a whole other marketing funnel that we really have to work on. And at that point, that's when that's when I feel like the influencer marketing and the key opinion leaders and like your evangelists, they come into play. That's when you're using your customers, right? To feed, feed back like what's going well, what's not going well across all of the industries. And then sharing out like what their thoughts are on on your product, your business, your service, your product. Yeah, I, I what is going on right now is just is what you just said. Like customers are now, you know, more influential like than before. Um, yeah. I read, I took a quick course last weekend about the pump and funnel um, marketing strategy. Again, back to terms, it's just the typical marketing funnel, but yeah. with a pump that takes it back to awareness. So, but that pump is yeah. really the customers. The customers become the advocates, they become loyalists, they spread the word, there's social proof and all that and all that. And that's also happening in the B2B space as well. But uh, I will yeah. be interested to see what happens five years from now where there's like full adoption of prospective um, influencing, like you've said, and even then some. Uh, so it's interesting to see, but well, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, think yeah. I've, I've seen this on social media a lot as well, too, and probably more in, you know, the B2C and D2C space. But, you know, those okay. people who are have not been asked to review something but want to be able to give that honest, feed, uh, that honest feedback, I think, like, that's mm -hmm. that, that prospect and influencer marketing that you're talking about as well. And I think as mm -hmm. a brand, being able to leverage this person that's talking about your brand brand like about your product about your business it could be a service like i think that mm. that's really huge and it does happen on from business to business because at this point i think there are, are so many more businesses that are on social media as well too and are seeing it as part of like their marketing strategy like i have to view the behind the scenes let me tell you the story of like someone reaching out so i think that there's a lot of that stuff that is happening right now mm. yeah it makes sense makes sense um, I would like us to talk about a little bit, not too much, about uh, communication. Um, and when it comes to influencer marketing, we know that it's either about social proof or the authority principle. Um, I've, I've read the, the book by Carl Dini, Psychology of Persuasion, and that was mentioned there. But I know that's a very common psychological trait. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to find out through your career, what has been the most su successful angles to you know, giving an influencer some communication to you know their community to say this is how you should speak. This is how it has worked in B two B. What are some of those um, communication angles that you think resonate uh, most with B two B B two B customers? Again, I won't be surprised if you say it depends on the. <laughs> I know right. everything. <laughs> yeah, that is always the answer. That's every marketing answer. It depends. Don't paint me, you know, don't put baby in a corner. Okay. Because then yeah. I'm going to have to live with that answer. And this is forever memorialized in um, audio and video format. In, but, in, um, in, in Femi, audio and video in Femi. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, so as far as like the communication standpoint, I think what I have seen to be the most successful, honestly, is communicating your goal, not what they have to say. And that mm. is across different businesses. And this is also why it should take a long time to find the right creators and influencers for your brand. Because if you find the right ones, you're not worried about how they're going to say it. You're hiring them, whether it's product gifting, whether it's, you know, that you're paying them full out, whether they're an affiliate, you you are activating them because of their voice, because of the way that they are delivering it. They are delivering it in a way to their audience that you as a brand cannot. So tell them, bring them into the loop and say, hey, th these are my goals. 
This mm -hmm. is the business. This is the challenge that I'm trying to overcome. You are the expert in your domain. How would you do that? How do you see this happening? So I think it's really taking influencer marketing, again, across B2B, B2C, D2C, all of these things, and bringing them into the folds of like what you're, try what you're trying to overcome, what you're trying to get across. What is the best way to do that to resonate with your audience? Because if you're just putting your words in an influencer's voice, it's not going to land. That's not going to give you the social proof. I mean, it will bring you awareness, but maybe it's not going to give you the type of exposure that you're really looking to achieve. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, before I let you go, Katia, I would like us to look at some best practices or, well, it's false to avoid. Um, one of them, which is prevalent right now, is the advent of AI. And I feel AI might start to raise the issue of... Um, impersonation. Uh, I've had this experience uh, many years ago, I think back in 2013, where we strongly advised uh, the management not to be careful in using the, the CEO as an influencer and let's have a method around it. And then they went on and did it and people started to impersonate the CEO to scam people. Imagine this was a bank. So people were sending monies to people. Um, so how, what are your, I guess, um, I would call it safety uh, guidelines um, in terms of preventing things like this, uh, especially when it comes to the B2B side. How do we prevent impersonation in future, um, having unwanted influencers, for example, and things like that? Um, and that's, this is not specific to AI. It's just, you know. Yeah, just, you know, tech tech in general, or the problem of impersonation in general. That's right. I really wish that I had the answer for that. But I will honestly say, I think the best way to avoid the pitfall is to be selective. Be okay. selective of the people that you're reaching out to and understand that you know, we live in a time and space where it is technology. People are going to impersonate. There's going to be you know, no one wants to be catfished, like no yeah. business wants to be catfished either. No yeah. consumer wants to be. I think it's it, to avoid that pitfall is to be selective with who you have representing your brand from an influencer perspective, for sure. And then also understand that sometimes technology takes over and you can't help that. There is okay. no one to blame except for technology. You're always going to get like the spam. A mm. And I guess, thirdly, address it head on. Like to me, okay. that's the big thing. If you know that, you know, someone could possibly be impersonated, he, you know, solve the problem at the start, not like when it becomes like an issue. So I would mm -hmm. say like, think, think through that. If, if this is going to be a common thing that people hesitate over, address that in the content that you're creating with the influencers that you're creating. And this is probably better articulated with a, an, an analogy or an example, actually, that's what I want to use an analogy, not an analogy, but an example. So like, for example, I am definitely the consumer that purchases off of social media. You know, yeah. those, the pants that I've been wanting to wear, I keep coming up on my feed. I want to click on the button. Here's, here's the thing though. I've ordered so many things that either take too long or not as they've been posted. So I already yeah. know that going into it. Now I have yeah. this natural hesitation. It's kind of that yeah. same hesitation that a person would have with impersonation, right? Like, is, yeah. this, is this really the person? Why would they be reaching out to me? Is this really the product that I'm going to get? Is it worth it? Is it going to be here on time? So what I would advise is like, if you know that's already in their head, Try to answer that and solve it with what you're pushing out with a creator and an influencer. This is the challenge, right? Like, mm. hey, I know that people are going to be concerned about shipping and like, is it as it's seen? Let the content speak to that so that it's not a worry. Because what you want them to do mentally, psychologically, is to be nodding yes in their head as they're watching something, because that's going to increase your conversion. If they're like, 
filled with hesitation, their head is saying no without even like knowing that their head is saying no. But if you've addressed it head on, like do that. Mm -hmm. So I think like that to me is the best way to avoid the pitfall is to understand what the challenges are, communicate the challenges, and then also meet them head on. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I did some of the other advices or advice. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of what to avoid when it comes to B2B influencer marketing in general, whatever comes to your head at this point. Whatever comes to my head is yeah. don't think numbers. Okay. <laughs> like don't think in numbers only, I guess. And that could be in how many you need to activate, but also how much money they're going to bring in. So be, yeah, don't think in numbers and be very realistic with the expectations because everything takes time and finding the right yeah. people, that's going to take time too. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm not disappointed, Katya. It's been an awesome time. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing you. your superior marketing wisdom you know it's uh it's fun as always and i think um this content will serve as a guide for uh many b2b influencer marketers going forward uh so wh where can uh, business leaders uh, find you most especially your podcast yeah so uh you can find me on linkedin uh katia okay. allison so just look me up i'm also you know the head of marketing at shared vision that's something else that you can look up as well too uh mm -hmm. let's talk marketing is a podcast that i host super excited about that you can also find that on linkedin on apple and spotify or really wherever it is that you listen to podcasts is where you can find let's talk marketing um they're very much so like this a conversation where we dig into very specific topics um as it relates to marketing and i'm really excited about that but definitely look for me on linkedin um, on Instagram, Allison Katya. It's less as impressive, but if you really want to get a peek into my personal life, that's you can find me on Instagram uh, and then LinkedIn, yeah. like I said. Yeah, no, don't don't mind what she said there. She is a very she is the queen of influencer marketing. That's for sure. Oh, so. you're too sweet. You're too sweet. But I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's all for today, guys. Thank you for listening. See more episodes at dotslovesmarketing.com. And subscribe to the Marketing Leadership Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Till the next episode, connect the dots. Thank you for listening to the Marketing Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Dots Loves Marketing. There will be links to any resources mentioned in today's show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.